Well, good morning. Shake the hand of two or three people. Tell them God is faithful. Just think for a moment where your life would be if it wasn't for Jesus. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I'd be dead. I wouldn't be alive because God carried us through so many, 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 many things. Great to see so many of you here this morning. Let me first say how many of you were at the women's conference and you were really blessed? Well, I thought Friday night I stuck, snuck in here and I thought it was a Lions conference. By the way, you don't know Lisa, but um, our male conference is called the Lions conference. And all you spoke about was the lion. I thought maybe we should invite you to speak at the Lions conference. Amen. But the, lady, the ladies had a wonderful time. Amen. Oh, you can do better than that, girls. Amen. Welcome to all our churches, Pretoria. Watch you on the screen this morning. God bless you. Welcome. We love you. God's doing a great thing in Pretoria. Johannesburg, we welcome you this morning. Welcome, we welcome you. George, we welcome you. Rustenburg, we welcome you. Uppington, Polokwane. Then, of course, our very special brothers and sisters across the country in prison this morning. All those in Polesmore Prison down in Cape Town, Pretoria Central Prison, Kruetfly Prison right here in Bloemfontein, in Uppington and Kimberley. We especially want to welcome you this morning. We know that God is faithful and we know that no matter what our past is, God has a future for us. And every week it is a great honor and a great privilege for us to bring the Word of God to you, which is a word of hope. God is a God of, of the future. And I know as you stay connected with God right where you are, as you study the Bible, as you pray, God's going to give you a vision and God's going to give you a dream. And the best days of your head, life are ahead of you. Good things are heading your way. Come on, let's welcome those people, especially this morning with us from Bloomingdale. Come on, give them a warm, warm, warm welcome. And then Radio Eden FM, we welcome you. Radio Panorama, we welcome you. And then, of course, our television audience, we welcome you. And if you're a first-time visitor here in Bloemfontein, Pretoria, Johannesburg, any one of our churches, God bless you. Welcome. You are going to be blessed out of your socks this morning. We have a special surprise for you. Dynamite comes in small packages. So, you know, I'm a fan of the girls, right? The women. Because we believe that, uh, I do believe it, and I'm outspoken in this, that some things women can do much better than men, like having babies. <laughs> no, 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 I just had to say that, that's not true. Because if men had to have babies, we'd never have the baby, amen. Because men just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, no, that's just a, 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 a little a, a joke. I believe that God's raising up special people at this time, special women. We've raised our daughters to have a total free spirit, to be strong. Many men are threatened by strong women. I love strong women with a free spirit that want to go into the world and take charge of what God called them. Just not of their husbands. Amen. Take charge of anything, but don't take charge of your husband. Love your husband. Submit to your husband in a loving way because... If you're the woman that you should be, your husband will be 10 times stronger and run further for God. So we have one of the great, great ladies with us this morning that spoke at the women's conference. And I thought, I'm still going to be here in Bloomingdale for the next 40 years in Pretoria and Johannesburg. So uh, she's not going to be here for the next 40 years. Maybe uh, whenever she comes back next year, willing, if she's willing you're going to have, as men, the privilege this morning to hear some of the good stuff that the ladies heard as well. So one of our great, great Bible teachers travels all over the world and preaches the gospel, the word of God, Lisa Bavia. We're going to welcome her to the platform right now. Come on, put your hands together, Pretoria Bloemfontein, and welcome her to the platform this morning for the word of the Lord. Well, I have fallen in love with all of you. I'm so glad to see the guys here today. Oh, did I drop notes? Oh, awesome. Okay, so I consider it an honor and a privilege to speak into your life. I believe that God has given me a message of life and strength for this body. John and I love you. We love your pastors. 
We love the destiny that is on this nation even more than we love the history of this nation. Even though the history is amazing, the destiny is bigger than you can even imagine. So I am so honored to lend a little bit of my American strength to this nation and this body of believers. I'm so honored to speak to you people far and near. It's awesome. So if you want to go ahead and sit down, I'm going to show you a little bit of my world, then I'm going to pray, then I'm going to preach. Is that okay? All right. I come from a very male-dominated world. I'm going to show a picture. I am the mother of four sons. And being the mother of four sons made me realize just how amazing men are. Matter of fact, I hate that our culture does everything to emasculate and dishonor the men and to sexualize the women. Having sons, and not just sons, as you can see, I'm actually the mother of men now, means that I love to build men. And the Bible says that a wise woman builds her house. So what do wise men do? They build their women. Because if you build your women, then the women will build the house. And so my husband is really smart. He has built me so I can build his house. I have four sons. I have Alexander there. Alexander is 20 years of age. I told the women that Alexander was my educational challenge. I spent his entire school career apologizing to teachers. When it came time for him to have an entrance exam into college, his test scores were so bad that when they passed it to me, I just started laughing. You know, I mean, there's like, wow, you should have tried harder. And then there is hilarious. His test scores were hilarious. I was laughing. He started laughing. The guidance counselor said, this is serious. <laughs> As you can see, college is not an option for Alec. But we were laughing because Alec had already been hired by Apple Computer, who thought that college was an option for him and had committed $10,000 a semester for whenever he chose to go. And I love my son Alec because he thinks different and we need a generation of young people who think different and sometimes that means they won't test well in this dynamic but they will flourish in the next one. And so put them back up there, that's my Alexander. And then I have Austin, Austin's just super smart. He is smarter than John and I put together. And then I have the really tall one that looks like he might be South African. We're not sure what happened. We do have some Dutch in John's genes. They all just got into his genetics. He is six foot three. He beats up all of the other brothers. He loves being the youngest, but the biggest. And then I have my firstborn son, Addison. He is so amazing. He is all of the good and none of the bad of John and I. I knew to pray that on my first one. And he is holding Asher, my very first grandson, who is trying to escape the picture, as you can see. And then right below him is my granddaughter, Sophia Grace, and my beautiful daughter-in-law, who is from the same native tribe as I am. We are both one-eighth Apache Indian. If you don't know about the Apaches, Geronimo is kind of our person. We were the last ones to go on reservation because we were the warrior tribe. And so that is kind of them. And there's me and my husband of 30 years. The very cute and I believe sexy John Bevere. And then I'm going to show you a picture up close of my grandson because grandchildren should be seen closer. Okay, there he is. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm his favorite. He's really missing me. He calls my house G-Mama's house. He doesn't call it G-Daddy's house. He says, I need to go to G-Mama's house. And he should say that because I spoil him rotten. I play with him. I sing for him. I dance for him. I whip my hair back and forth for Asher. Anything Asher wants from me, Asher gets from me. And John has told me to stop whipping my hair around. He said, you are training him to like dangerous women. But the truth is, I am a dangerous woman. I'm going to put up my motorbike. I have a, a ninja. That is me on my bike. I believe if we're going to change the world, we need some ninja riding grandmothers. Okay, so that is me on my bike. And then we're going to show you Sophie up close. 
Sophie is so awesome. She has no hair. But what she lacks in hair, she makes up for in thighs. She has the most massive thighs. Last report, she's still not walking, and she's 15 months because her feet are about this big and her thighs are about this big. She cannot support them yet. Anyways, she is awesome. And I show all of these pictures because I learned a long time ago that how you see me is how you'll hear me. And I am a grandmother, which means I want to be sure that what my children and my grandchildren inherit is truly grand. And even though I have a really hard time seeing things up close, I have no problem seeing things in the distance. And in the distance, I see a magnificent uprising for the church of Jesus Christ. And so I want to declare this scripture over this meeting. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. I'm going to read it out of the message. Jesus is saying this. God's spirit is on me. He has chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Sent me to announce pardon to prisoners. Recover of sight to the blind. To set the burdened and battered free. And to announce this is... God's year to act. I love that. This is God's year to act. Right now, the most popular movie in America is a movie called Avengers. It is a collection of action heroes. This is God's year to act. And I'm going to preach to you today about being an action hero. So Heavenly Father, I ask that you would take my words and your scriptures and that you would weave a massive image of what you have for your sons and your daughters, your mothers and your G-mamas, your G-daddies and your fathers. God, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now I'm going to tell you a completely random story. I got to go to five countries in a very short amount of time two years ago. And uh, I landed actually home from London on my 50th birthday. And I remember I was so tired as I traveled home that I called my husband from Chicago and I said, if you throw a surprise birthday party for me, I will walk out the door. Do not do that to me. I just want to brush my teeth. I just want to remember who I am. I was so tired. It took me about two days to, you know, of wandering in the house. And on one of the particular days, I noticed I was home alone with my youngest son. Now, you don't understand how important that is to me. See, my youngest son used to be the most affectionate. He used to cuddle me all the time. He used to sit on my lap and say, it's time for morning love. He used to ask me to marry him, but the three older brothers shamed him out of that stage. They would say, you can't marry mom. Stop cuddling mom. Big guys don't do things like that. But when none of the brothers were around, I figured I could sit on the sofa with him and I could cuddle him. I could rub his shoulders and he wouldn't know I was cuddling him. And so I got next to him on the sofa, began to rub his shoulders, and I said, Arden, what movie are we watching? And he said, we are watching Terminator 1. Now, I am not saying it is a Christian movie. There is nothing godly about that movie. It is 80s awful, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story from that movie. Is that okay? It's the story of Sarah Connor. She is a moped riding waitress. She goes to work every day where she serves pie and coffee, and then she goes out every night hoping that some blind date's going to work for her. That is until her assassin from the future shows up. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who used to be the governor of California, and Maria Shriver's husband came back from the future, and he had in his possession the height of 80s data, which was a yellow page from the you know, telephone book, and he was systematically assassinating Sarah Connors. I think four were done. They were gone. And everybody kind of looked at her during break and said, isn't that your name? And she was like, yeah. And her response to that was the typical 1980s response. She went out to a bar. 
I don't know why she would think that would be a good idea, but she goes out to maybe be lost in a crowd, and then Arnold shows up, and he begins to shoot people. But at the same moment as her assassin from the future shows up, her protector from the future shows up. He grabs a hold of her, and he says, you, you're getting it. If you want to live, come with me. She sees the dead bodies. She's like, I think I want to live. She leaves with this stranger. They get in the car. They're trying to escape the relentless Arnold. And all of the time, there is chaos and mayhem and bullets flying. Her protector from the future is trying to tell her who she is. He says, in the future, you're a hero. In the future, you have sent strategies to your son. And she's like, wait a minute. I'm not even dating anybody. I don't have a son. There's been a huge mistake. And he's like, is this you? And she's like, oh, no, what is going on? And so she becomes overwhelmed. She has a meltdown. And she yells, I haven't done anything. And he looks at her. And he says, no, but you will. And when I heard that, I realized the enemy often knows who you are before you discover who you are. And you need to learn the two things that Sarah learned in the car that night. Number one, if you're a Christian, you're a target. And we all have the same name. And if you make it personal, you will isolate yourself from the body. You must stay connected because you are part of something way bigger than you can imagine. Christian, he's got your name. He goes and systematically attacks us. It's not personal. It's just good business. Target. But you just might be a hero. I say might be because the choice is going to be up to you. And you must know something. The attacks on your life up until this moment have much more to do with who you might be in the future than who you have been in the past. And if you have gone through hell, you need to keep going because there is something of strength and destiny for you on the other side. That has set me up to preach to you out of my least favorite scripture. John told me I shouldn't have least favorite scriptures, but how many of you know there are some scriptures that are fun to read and horrible to live? This is my least favorite scripture to live, and it is found in the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. I'm going to read it from the message. It says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. Guess what? For the action hero, there is only one option, and that is the God option. Now, I just read a massive amount of scriptures. I'm going to break it down. Considered a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. Another version says, count it pure joy. Seriously? I mean, I love, I love Noretta. We've become friends. Let's say I get on my plane tonight, and I land in Denver, and I discover that tests and challenges 
have surrounded my life. It's like the roof is caving in, the rug has been pulled out, and I call Noretta, I'm like, Pastor Noretta, you cannot believe what has happened to me since I left South Africa. My world has collapsed. And she bursts into song. She starts singing the hallelujah chorus, and she says, what a sheer gift. I am so happy for you, my friend. Let's count this pure, what all bad is happening? Let's count each of these horrible things pure joy. I would hang up on her, and I would call Chris Kane, because I know that Chris Kane would get angry with me. But perhaps I am looking at things the wrong way, because apparently our God sees an ambush without any means of escape as an opportunity. Goes on to say, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open. I know that. Do you guys know that? I mean, I love it when I go to the, you know, the spa and they're like, what kind of pressure do you want for your massage? Light, medium, or deep tissue? That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about under pressure where it's like maybe relaxing. I'm talking about under pressure that feels like it begins to crush you. So much so that your faith life or what you cry out for or what you cry out to is forced into the open. I don't necessarily like sometimes what I see under pressure, but who I am under pressure is who I really am. And as unpleasant as it is in that moment, I'd rather find out now where I am weak and where I am strong so I can let God make the weak places in my life strong. Now I understand that the name of your city is like Blooming Fountain or Water uh, Flower Fountain or whatever. Okay, Blue Fountain. I can't even say it. So embarrassing to have an American accent. But anyway, I live in a world that is not known for flowers. I live in a world that is known for blizzards. We have blizzards or snowstorms 11 out of our 12 months. There is only one month on record without a blizzard in Colorado, and that is July. And so if I want to have flowers like you have, I have to buy the bulbs, and I have to put them in the drawer of my refrigerator. And they say, rest easy, my friends. You are having a beautiful, mild winter. And then when it should be spring, I bring them out. And I put them on the windowsill of my laundry room. The sunshine comes in. It's shining outside, but there's three feet of snow. They think it's spring. They begin to sprout a little bit. And then I can put them outside for the six-week growing season. What am I doing? It's called forcing them. And God is creating climates and environments in the spirit for his people to bloom under pressure. We are a people that are to bring forth fruit when other people are barren. We are a people who are to flourish where everybody else is in devastation. The environment that destroys others is an environment that forces our faith life into the open. It goes on to say, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. I'm just going to tell you this as a grandmother. Life is a series of tests. You can opt out, but I'm going to tell you the retest is always harder. Stay the course. Be consistent. You will not like the retest. It is always harder. Don't get out of it prematurely. Just stick with it. So many things you will win the victory in life just by outlasting them. Let it do its work so you can become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. You know, God already knows our condition and our developmental level. He allows environments and climates and hardship to come into our life 
so that we discover our condition. I think you guys know uh, Planet Shakers. I, got, I had the privilege of going down there and preaching, and I, I kind of think they're kind of like, hey, we paid this much money for you to fly down here. You're going to preach 25 times. And so I don't know what happened, but I preached so many times. I didn't know if I was coming or going. I didn't know if I was preaching the word or heresy. I had no idea by the end of the exhaustion of jet lag world. And I, I'm saying this because you need to know I was vulnerable. I was vulnerable. And at the very end of it, one other woman came up to me. And she said, I've been watching you all weekend. And I figured out who it is that you remind me of. And I said, who? And she said, you remind me of the original Sarah Connor. And I looked at her and I said, wasn't she blonde? And she said, oh, no, it's not her hair. It's her buffness. OK, you tell a woman over 50 <laughs> that she is buff, she will want to believe you. I treasured that hope in my heart. I tried not to act too excited in that moment. I flew home and I got my son Alexander. I said, Alexander, you need to find me pictures of the original Sarah Connor. See, I hadn't watched the movie yet. And, he's, and he said, why? I said, Alec, people are saying I look like her. And he said, Mom, you don't. I said, Alec, I'm serious. People are saying I look like her. So he pulls up this 80s montage of her. She's riding a motorcycle. Hello, I ride a motorcycle. She's got a gun that she's cocked with one arm. I am a deadly shot. I have a 16-point buck on the wall of my office that I dropped. I tell my husband, if you commit adultery, there will be no scandal. <laughs> there will be an assassination. But then there was another moment that I felt like I connected with Sarah. She had been imprisoned, but she understood what to do with a season of imprisonment. She flipped her twin bed up against the wall, and she was doing pull-ups you know, from the underside of the bed. She was a woman that understood that you use seasons of captivity to develop strength. I said, ooh, I am spiritually connected to this woman. And so I did something I had never done before. I picked up the phone and I called Gold's Gym. And I said, I believe I am two appointments away from the Terminator woman. I need to come in and work out with you. And the guy said to me, you know, you can come in, but we're going to have to do an assessment. But I was crazy in that moment. I was blinded by her buffness. And I went into the gym. And you can only imagine what I discovered. It began with push-ups. The guy said, give me 10. It was humiliation from the very beginning. Then jumping jacks. I couldn't remember if my hands were supposed to touch at the top or not. My boys were in the background going, no, you're doing them wrong. It went from bad to horrible. And that assessment didn't happen in a private room. No, no, they stuck me in the middle of the gym where everybody could just notice how incredibly unfit I was. And then he took me back to the cubicle and he let me know I had flunked every level of the physical assessment. And then he handed me this thing that looked like a Nintendo game controller and it shot an electrical current through my body to measure my fat percentage. I felt confident that I was safe on that. But no, it was shocking how fat I was. He began to point out the other women. He'd say, do you see that woman? She's quite larger than you, but you're fatter. You're fatter than her. You're fatter than her. I'm like, seriously? He said, yes, you're something we call skinny fat. <laughs> I'm like, this is not right. And I said, I am not a lazy person. I am a busy person. He said, yeah, you're busy, but you're burning your muscle. You are not building it. If you want to build muscle, you must bear a load. And so many people in the church right now, you are not bearing the weight. You are caving and you are hiding 
in busyness. You are burning muscle rather than building it. If you don't know what you're doing, can I just be honest with you? I never know what I'm doing. If you don't, it's like, for me, it's like, since you don't know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. It's not like he's going to say, are you seriously asking me for help? Lisa, I can't believe you don't have it figured out right now. You should have all this figured. No. He says, he loves to help. How many of you know that where we're going is a place no one's ever been before? And we cannot look back to figure out where we are going. We are walking into the threshold of a time that all the saints are going to be cheering us on. And we need the involvement of God if we are going to finish this season with strength. So we need to pray to the Father. He loves to help. We'll get his help. And he won't condescend us or say, that's so stupid that you need help when we ask for it. Now, I am married to John Bevere. And Pastor Andre was hosting me today. And he said, John is a lot of energy. Yeah, John is a lot of energy. I am actually thankful that he travels sometimes. Sometimes I'm just like, baby, you are a lot of energy. You need to go on a trip. You need to go on a trip. But every year at Christmas time, I have him home for about four weeks, which is dangerous. So he'll go out and pray. And he'll come back looking like Moses. And I'll start getting nervous, like, okay, what's, what's going on? What are you going to do? He's a visionary man. He's a man of great vision. I'm like, I, I think... I think you're doing, going to do something scary. And he's like, you'll find out in January. So this was not last January, but the January before. My husband had been out praying, man of vision. He gathers me and my oldest son and Aaron, our CFO. It's supposed to be the Council of Four. I don't actually know why it's called that because it's really just John. And he said to me, it has come into my heart to give away 250,000 books this year. I threw up in my mouth. I don't know if you do that in South Africa, but I, I seriously, I threw up in my mouth. I was like, oh my goodness. I said, um, how many books have we ever given away in one year's time before in a good economy? He said, 60. So I said, how about 100,000? How about 100,000? He made a fist. He slammed it down on the table. He said, Lisa, my faith is attached to 250,000. I just began to nod my head. Okay, okay. We all began to nod our head. Okay, okay. We stood up, the four of us. We joined hands. And then we prayed a prayer that scared what was scared inside of us. If you are not praying the type of prayers that scare you, it is certainly not scaring the enemy. You must pray scary prayers, not things that you can do, things that can only happen when God gets involved. I haven't spent a lot of time with your pastor, but I bet he is a scary prayer man. <laughs> Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. How shameful. I was the second thought. How about 100,000? We put my husband on a trip before he could come up with another idea. <laughs> and we began to try to figure out how we were going to give away 250,000 books when a phone call came. And an oil man from Texas called, and he said, I've heard you want to give away 250,000 books in Arabic and Farsi and Mandarin and countries I can't even pronounce their languages, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Urdu. And he said, I'm going to write you a check for $300,000. I'm just going to tell you something. I know that if we'd gone with $100,000, I'd still be trying to figure out how to pay for it. But when you give God a faith framework, he will provide for it. People who worry their prayers. What does a worry prayer sound like? Oh, God, I just hope my children make it out of school, virgins. Oh, God, please just maybe, maybe on their deathbed, they'll become a Christian. No, you may not pray over your children like that. You do not pray over your children according to the environment. You do not pray over your children according to the culture. You do not pray over your children according to the media. You pray over your children 
according to the word of God. I tortured my sons every night before they went to bed. I lined them up and I said, you are for signs and wonders. You are not for death and destruction. You are princes of the most high God. They were like, seriously, mom, we just want to put on our pajamas. I'm like, no, we're going to put on our armor now. They'd be like, what? We just want to sleep. No, you are not normal children. You have been given to me. They would go to bed every night in the armor, blood applied. It was exhausting for them. It was exhausting for me. But you know what? You shoot the arrow of God's word into the destiny and the future of your children. And it will meet them there in strength. And they will pick it up. And they will shoot it into the destiny of their children. We cannot be wind whipped. We cannot be like waves. We cannot be influenced by the winds of our culture, by the winds of doctrine. We must be solid on the word of God. There is no other option but the God option. Pastor, how much time do I have? I forgot to look at the clock. Just five minutes. Awesome, I can do so much in five minutes. You just watch this. Okay, so sometimes... When you start thinking like this, crazy things come out of your mouth. And I was on an airplane with headphones on, working on a manuscript, and I kind of forgot anybody else was on the plane. I was so like intent on working when the pilot made an announcement. I was traveling from Colorado Springs to Austin, Texas, going to go preach for our friends, Joe and Lori Champion, and the pilot said, hey, I'm sorry, the Austin airport is closed, so we're going to circle for a while, but if it doesn't open, we're going to go to San Antonio. And without realizing it, I just, I blurted out, that's not an option for me. And I had headphones on, so I think I did it about that loud. And you know when you kind of like say something out loud, then you kind of think, man, I hope I just thought that. I hope I didn't actually say that. There's a lot of things you can do on airplanes, but being loud and having an attitude in the United States is not one of them. And so I knew I had actually said it when my flight attendant unhooked her seatbelt and came barreling down the aisle with only me in her sights. And I said, oh gosh, I said it out loud. And I thought, what do I do? What do I do? Do I say, I'm sorry, it was just a moment of insanity, or do I stay with it? I said, God, am I supposed to speak tonight? And he said, yes. And so she put her hands on her hip, she gets in my face, she said, girlfriend, if the airport is closed, that is your only option. And I said, no, it needs to open. That's not going to work for me. And she's like, there's thunderstorms. I'm like, they need to move. And everybody just kind of looked at me like, throw her off the plane. <laughs> we circled for a while, and um, the pilot comes on. And he's like, I'm sorry, the airport still isn't open. We're going to have to go to San Antonio. And everybody was looking at me like, see? <laughs> you would think they would be like, yes, we're with you. And so Texas is a really, really big state. And so we did the big turn, and we began to fly towards San Antonio. But just before we hit the halfway mark, the Austin airport reopened. And the pilot comes on, the speaker, and he says, people. The Austin airport opened, and we're still closer to Austin than we are San Antonio. So we're going to turn around, and we're going to go back to Austin. Now everybody's looking at me like, how did you know? <laughs> and I felt a little self-conscious. It was a little regional jet. And I looked across the aisle, and for the first time, I noticed there was this, like, massive Samoan man covered with tattoos across the aisle from me. He should have been the one making bold declarations, not the skinny little white woman. And so I looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, I just had something I had to go to. He puts his finger out and he said, hey, don't you apologize to me. He said, as soon as you said, that's not an option. He said, I began to pray because that was not an option for me either. Sometimes God just needs one person to say, 
lost children. That's not an option. <laughs> Neighbors who don't know about Jesus, that's not an option. A loveless marriage, that's not an option. We must be a people who understand that God needs our words. The book of James closes with a scripture I actually like. James 4, 7 through 8 says, So let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quite quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. God needs your words. He needs your strength. He needs you to draw a line in the sand and say what is and what is not an option. Stand to your feet right now. I want you to lift up your hands and I want you to say, Father, Father. your will, Father. your word Father. is the only option. I say no to the devil. You will not have any way or any place in my life, in my family, in my destiny. I know I've been a target, but this day, I choose to be a hero. Amen and amen.